All right, everybody. Um, welcome to lesson number seven. Uh, this lesson deals with latent heat and the concept of latent heat. So I'm pulling this from pages 29 through 31 of our recommended textbook. So, but if you don't have this, that's okay. I also have a handout that you can use to follow along. And so let me ask you, have you ever gotten up in the morning, a uh, very dry morning outside, taken a shower, feel, felt nice and warm, and then stepped out of the shower? How did it feel? It probably felt very cold. Um, actually, one of the uh, example videos I'm going to show later today actually deals with that. And this concept will actually explain why that happens. So that being said, let's jump in. So the first thing I want to mention about the concept of latent heat is that Earth is really unique. And the reason why it is, is at least as of our current understanding, Earth is the only planet in the solar system that has all three phases of water. I'm not going to talk about plasma here, so let's not get into that. But the other three phases, liquid, solid, and gas, all readily available on its surface and in its atmosphere. So that makes Earth really unique. And it's believed that that is what's considered crucial for sustaining life. So Earth is the only planet where water exists in all three phases. And we see this in the terms of solid snow or hail or um, sleet or icebergs, um, liquid, obviously, the oceans. Um, and then in vapor, vapor, you can kind of see it evaporating as steam, but a lot of times it's invisible because it's actually in the atmosphere. It's actually a part of the air that you're breathing right now. So it's believed that it's believed that Earth is currently, at least as, as of our current knowledge, the only planet in the solar system that has all three of these. And that's believed to be crucial for supporting life on Earth. So um, water has three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. And... One of the interesting things about Earth, because of Earth's temperature range, water doesn't actually stay in any one of these individual phases. Instead, water oftentimes is very regularly undergoing phase changes. What that means is that water, in essence, is transitioning from one phase to another. Um, take an ice cube out of the freezer. What does it do? It melts. That's a phase change. Um, or boil some water and you watch the steam coming off that water. That's actually water evaporating. Um, and so the idea here is that water is constant. Well, not constantly, but water is regularly changing phases. It's going from one phase to another. That being said, one of the things I haven't talked about yet um, up to this point in this class, I've talked a lot about sensible heat. I've talked about conduction, convection, and radiation. But one of the things I haven't mentioned yet is that in order for water to make that jump from one phase to another, it actually has to exchange heat with its surroundings. And the reason why this happens is when water is what we, in what we call a lower state, a state of lower energy such as ice, such as a solid, for to make that jump to liquid, something has to happen that sort of breaks the individual water molecules apart from one another. And that something is heat. Heat needs to be absorbed in order for that to happen. And we call that heat latent heat. The interesting thing about latent heat is as latent heat is being absorbed, it doesn't actually change the temperature of the water itself. Um, I actually have a, another video. I'll, I'll put it in the comments, and I'll also put it as one of the links in today's lesson. Um, it's about 30 minutes long, but it actually shows you that as you're boiling ice water, as you're heating up ice water, uh, I guess you're not boiling it yet, but as you're heating up ice water, the temperature isn't really going up in the container of ice water, 
until all of the ice is melted. And the reason why is because heat from the hot plate that is going into the water is instead melting the water. It's, it's melting the ice, changing it from solid to liquid. The same thing actually happens when water starts to boil. If you actually take a look at the temperature of water as it's boiling, it actually remains steady. And this little graphic here actually shows that very well. Let me pull out my little laser pointer. Um, if you start with a big bowl of ice, that ice starts off with a temperature below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as you continue to warm the ice up, its temperature goes up, and eventually it hits that magical melting point of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or for us science nerds, zero degrees Celsius. At that point, the ice begins to undergo a phase change. Well, what's interesting is that as the ice is undergoing the phase change, you're still applying heat to it, but its temperature is not increasing because all of that heat is going into breaking down the individual bonds that these individual molecules have with one another, causing them to spread out, and that's when the phase change happens. Um, so we oftentimes call this a hidden heat because applying heat in this situation doesn't actually change the temperature. Instead, it changes the phase. <laughs> there are two types of latent heat that I'm going to talk about very briefly. The first type is what's called latent heat effusion. And the way that latent heat effusion works, this is the heat that goes into either melting ice that's when water is moving up a phase. Or freezing the ice, that's when it's moving down a phase. When that happens, 334 kilojoules, uh, a joule is a unit of energy. It's a certain amount of energy. And a kilojoule is going to be 1,000 of those. So 334 kilojoules per kilogram. What this means is that for every kilogram of ice, you need to apply 334 kilojoules to melt it to liquid water. So that's the latent heat effusion. And then the opposite happens too. When water actually freezes, it has to release 334 kilojoules of heat per every kilogram of water. What's interesting though is the amount of heat needed for water to evaporate, this is what's called the latent heat of vaporization, is actually about seven times greater at 2,260 kilojoules per kilogram. So it takes much, much more heat to evaporate water than to melt it. This is one of the reasons why if you, um, if you leave out a tray of ice, it will melt pretty quickly because it doesn't actually take a lot of heat for that to happen. However, if you boil a pot of water, you could have that boil or you could have that hot plate on full, you could sit there for hours and there will still be water left in the in the container for a long period of time because you have to give it a lot of heat for that evaporation to happen. So, just a few quick um concepts with latent heat. So I mentioned these phrases moving up a phase and moving down a phase. Um, what that means when we talk about water, we're actually talking about three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas, solid, liquid, and gas. Solid is the lowest phase. It has the least amount of energy in it. Liquid is the intermediate phase and gas is the highest phase. And so moving up a phase is simply going from a lower phase, such as from a solid, to a higher phase, such as a liquid. Um, when that happens, latent heat needs to be absorbed from its surroundings. What this means is as, as water is undergoing that phase change, the heat needed for it to happen actually comes from its surroundings. So in essence, the water is sucking up heat from its surroundings. The same thing happens with boiling water, not just melting water, but also boiling water. And then the opposite, 
When going from a higher phase to a lower phase, what we call moving down a phase, such as going from a liquid to a solid, that actually causes water to release heat as it cools. In order for it to make that jump downward, it has to release heat. When those bonds are formed, as water molecules kind of bunch up together and connect in bonds, they release heat. So here's what this all actually means. So when water moves up a phase, it is absorbing heat from its surroundings. That actually cools those surroundings. So when you get out of the shower in the morning and you're covered in water and that water begins to evaporate, that's why it feels cold. Because what's actually happening is that in order for those water beads on your body to make that jump, they have to absorb heat from their surroundings. So that's why sweating cools your body. On the other hand, when water condenses, when it actually goes downward, when water condenses, when it, when it goes from a gas to a liquid, it actually releases a lot of heat. And this actually warms those surroundings. This warms the surrounding atmosphere. Um, if water was condensing on your body, you'd feel very, very hot. But this is all why sweating works as well. Sweating is like your, your, your body's natural system of temperature regulation. You, your body gets hot, it releases water, that water evaporates. Um, and what I always love to tell students is that even if you don't get this, even if, you, even if you don't fully understand this, which I hope you do, but even if you don't, the crazy, interesting, fun fact is that your body knows it. Your body, your individual cells, your whole body system knows it. That's pretty cool if you ask me. So just to summarize this whole concept really quickly, um, when water moves up a phase, such as when it melts, evaporates, or it skips the middle person, it goes from ice to water vapor, that actually cools the atmosphere. That sucks in heat from the atmosphere, cooling it. The opposite is true too, when water actually drops a phase, when it goes from water vapor to liquid or from liquid to ice, or skips the middle person and goes straight from vapor to ice, that actually happens in the upper atmosphere, that releases heat into the atmosphere and that is a warming process. The last thing I will say in this little, in this little lesson is just to prevent confusion. I have said that yes, evaporation is a cooling process. Meanwhile, condensation is a warming process. You may think, well, wait a second, Terrence. Don't you have to heat something up for it to evaporate? Isn't that heating it up? Absolutely. But we're meteorologists. We actually don't care about what's happening to the water. We care about what's happening to the atmosphere. So from an atmospheric perspective, in order for water to evaporate, it has to suck in heat from its surroundings. That cools those surroundings. On the other hand, when water moves down a phase, when it condenses or freezes, it releases heat into the atmosphere, warming the atmosphere up. So we're talking about from an atmospheric perspective. So when I say evaporation is a cooling process, I simply mean that you're going from a higher state to a lower state, or sorry, going from a lower state to a higher state, sorry about that, and you are absorbing heat from your surroundings. You're taking heat away from the atmosphere. That water is taking heat, and that cools the atmosphere. Whereas when it condenses, when it moves down a phase, it releases heat into the atmosphere. That warms the atmosphere.